So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this case research journal webinar. My name is Michael Goldman. I'm president of the North American Case Research Association, NACRA, uh, who own the case research journal. And it's my role, my very happy role this evening uh, to welcome you and to host and facilitate, I think, this really important conversation uh, about stronger participation uh, from India and involvement in the case research journal going forward. Forward. Uh, you have uh, the panel today. You have uh, the two people who are critical uh, to work with you uh, in publishing in the Case Research Journal. And so I'm delighted that Gina Grandi and Eric Delansky uh, are joining us this evening on this webinar. Gina Grandi, as you know, is editor of the Case Research Journal, uh, also Dean and Professor of Strategy and Leadership with the Hill Levine Schools of Business at the University of Regina in Canada. Eric Delansky is Associate Editor of the Case Research Journal and Professor of Marketing um, with the Goodman School of Business at Brock University, also happened to be in Canada. So we are very excited about this conversation. You'll see that uh, Gina and Eric have some slides ready to go uh, to take you through the conversation. But as Eric posted in the chat a few moments ago, um, very keen for a conversation, for questions, for discussion during the next hour. My role is very much in the background, and so after this short introduction, I'm going to hand over to Gina and Eric uh, and assist where I can and, and drive the conversation forward. So thank you again for joining us. We have, uh, gosh, over 24 attendees already in the room and should have a few more joining soon. Um, so with that, uh, Gina, Eric, let me hand over to you. That's great. Thanks so much, Michael, and welcome, everyone. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, Eric and I, as Michael has said, have prepared a set of slides that we'll move through. Eric and I will come in and out of the conversation, um, but we encourage you as you go through, if you have questions, to put them in the chat. Um, partway through, we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A, and then again, Towards the end, we'll have a Q&A because we do want this to be a conversation. We have lots of, um, we'll say, advice to, to offer, but we do want this very much to be a conversation. So I don't know, Eric, if you want to say hello and good morning before we kick off. Hello, good morning uh, for us, good evening for you. And I just would echo everything that was already said. Um, we're looking at ways that we can uh, make CRJ more successful by having high quality cases coming from authors based in India and looking for ways that we can help you as authors become more successful by getting your cases published in outlets like CRJ. Uh, so understanding where you may need some assistance or where we can offer advice is important. So please don't be shy about asking those questions. Sounds great. Um, Eric, if you don't mind advancing the slides, please. Um, these slides we're also happy to make available to those who are participating today. So don't worry that you have to rush and write down all of the comments. We'll make these available. We see that some of you are introducing yourselves in the chat. I'd encourage all of you to do that. We'd love to hear um, who's hear more from you as to who's joining us and where you're joining us from today. Um, so our topics for this evening, um, the case and I am focused the decision focus, case content, case writing style, and instructor's manual composition. And really, these are areas where in some ways, it would be for any case authors, we could talk about them. But in some instances, some of these are also coming from our experiences in working with authors um, who are from India, who submit to NACRA or submit to CRJ. So, while some of the content could be applied across the board, we also have um, reflected on our experience as editor and associate editor in working with case authors. Eric, if you can advance the slides. Great to see so many people here. Um, Michael has already really given us a great introduction, but just as context for you, just a quick glance, both Eric and I have been involved in case writing for many, many years and have published in numerous outlets and both involved with CRJ for, for some time um, and NACRA as well. 
Michael, before we um, go to this particular slide, I'm wondering if we can have um, the first poll. Most of you have um, written cases before. We have a couple of very new case writers here, which is great. Um, and uh, let's hope that we get you on the um, get you on the right place, right foot to start. Michael, I'm going to ask for that second poll as well for those who have written cases before, just to give us a sense of um, if you've published your work, where, and please check all that apply. Thank you, Michael. So as Eric has said, we see a nice spread of where people have published and a, and a couple of people in there, a few people in there who haven't published um, at all. And, and so we're going to hope that you're going to put your spot on CRJ so that um, that will be where you'll be targeting. Um, thanks, Michael, for this. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Eric, to give some context as to you know, why we're offering this particular session um, and, and the timing of it. Certainly. Uh, Gina and Michael and I discussed offering this session. We see a lot of submissions to NACRA and to CRJ coming from India, and that's fantastic. And this is a, a growth area for NACRA, and we'd like it to be a bigger growth area for CRJ as well. In seeing all of these submissions to the journal, some common uh, concerns or common comments from reviewers keep cropping up, which provided us the opportunity to look at this and say, is there something we can offer to sort of help with these areas that keep emerging as concerns on the part of reviewers so that our authors based in India can find more success in publishing? So that's where this is largely coming from. Um, a lot of these concerns are very fixable and have a lot to do with style. In my time writing cases and attending case conferences and in the few years I've been working at the CRJ at, uh, as an associate editor, I've noticed that there are styles from lots of groups of case authors around the world. French case authors have a particular style in which they write. South American case authors have a particular style in which they write, typically. And Indian case authors have a particular style in which they write. Um, it's not to say that any of these styles are right or wrong, but we do have a particular house style at CRJ for not just writing in terms of stylistic characteristics, but the components of the instructor's manual, the focus of the case, how the narrative is conveyed, um, the role of the protagonist, all of these we have expectations for publication in our journal. And what today's webinar is largely about is trying to find ways to help authors based in India align their style with our expectations and what changes need to be made. One thing I have communicated to many authors around the world is no comment from a reviewer, no comment from an editor means you have to change your case. What it means is if you want to increase the probability of your case being published at the case research journal, here's what we need from you. If you want to keep your case the way it is, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's your case. It's your decision to make. But if your goal is to get published in CRJ, then these changes need to be made, particularly around decision focus and around how you communicate the case narrative. Um, but where this is coming from, and I want to reiterate this, is because we get so many submissions from authors based in India, we don't want that opportunity to be squandered and to just say, sorry, your case doesn't fit what we're looking for. We want to make sure that all of you who have attended this webinar and all of those authors who have expressed an interest in publishing in CRJ get that opportunity. So what are these areas that we see as, as needing development on the part of authors based in India? And as, as Gina said earlier, a lot of these issues aren't only from Indian uh, based authors, uh, but they are common we find two authors based in India. So cases from Indian authors tend to be quite long. The narrative tends to be very detailed. It, 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 these cases cover a broad range of topics. That could be marketing and operations and strategy, or that could be many topics within marketing. We're gonna cover pricing and product and positioning and target market and, and metrics and all of these things all in one case. 
As I said, there's a lot of detail, particularly background detail, past instances, a long history of the company, a long history of the protagonist. For the most part, these cases have to do, and the, the 90 to 95% of the case narrative has to do with what has already happened in the past. Here is a decision that we made a while ago. Here's why we made that decision. Here is the outcomes from those decisions. That produces a more historical case, a more evaluative case, a, a case that I would call a textbook case, because that's the style of case you typically see in a published textbook, which is not the kind of case we're looking for at Case Research Journal. Another common theme uh, that I've noticed is that the author is a character in the case, possibly the protagonist, possibly an advisor to the protagonist, but very often in cases from authors based in India, I see that there is, the protagonist has this problem and goes to meet up with their old professor from university who has advice in this way. Um, typically only one person within the company will be interviewed. Uh, um, so in terms of the case, those are what we're seeing. For the instructor's manual, a lot of the time certain sections are missing. I will go into more detail about what sections those are later in the, today's presentation. Um, and the big one, the, the one that is going to be the biggest stumbling block or one of the biggest stumbling blocks to getting published is there's a misalignment between the data in the case and the analysis you're doing in the instructor's manual in that you can't do the analysis you've presented with the case data. You need additional data, you need additional knowledge. Um, one way that that's sometimes addressed is that theory is included in the case narrative, but this is not um, ideal. So what we're looking for in contrast is our shorter cases. We would like case manuscripts for the, the text part of the case to be uh, 10 pages or fewer, if possible. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it is certainly an important guideline. We are looking for a narrow focus. This is something uh, that Gina will be talking about in a few minutes. In terms of the background detail, less focus on what has already happened and more focus on the information that's gonna be needed for the forward-looking decision. Um, because the focus of the case is not on the company, it's not on what has happened, it's on where we're going from here, the decision that is yet to be made. The author is not a character in the case. The author is not the protagonist. That's what we're looking for at the CRJ. The author is unbiased, a third party, a third person narrator who um, is an observer uh, role as opposed to an active participant in the decision. If possible, interview multiple people within an organization. Um, add their quotes to the case, have more than one character in the case representing the organization, or at least get information from multiple sources, secondary sources um, yeah, included. Make sure your instructor's manual is complete and that it is aligned with the case information and that rather than putting the theory in the case narrative, you are using the theory that the students would have learned from this course or a previous course to do the analysis in the instructor's manual. So those are the key differences that we're seeing. I'm gonna uh, uh, invite Gina back to present uh, about focus. Thanks so much. And, and you're gonna see some overlap between that kind of summary slide that Eric went through and obviously as we move forward. So we'll try not to cover that material again and, and try to get us to some of the solutions um, so that we can help you think about sort of how is it you align your case and I am best for CRJ. So what we see here, and, and Eric has talked about it, but probably the number one reviewer comment that we receive is around focus or lack of focus. And, and really this comes in two forms or can come in two forms. And again, I wanna emphasize that part. This is, as Eric has said, less about saying there's something wrong with your case and more about us trying to um, give you a better appreciation for the expectations of case research journal and how we actually align your case with what we're looking for in the journal. So two kinds around this lack of focus. The case and the instructor's manual are unfocused. So there are too many things and areas, and I'm going to give an example of that in the next slide. So trying to do too much. And secondly, that the case isn't decision focused. And Eric is going to talk a little more about that 
just so that you can actually see some of the distinctions between what might feel like to you a decision focused case because it is talking about a past decision versus what CRJ is looking for in a decision focused case. And, and as already has been said, the cases tend to have a lot of detail and background and the decision gets lost. Now this sounds very, I think in some ways a bit flippant when we say, here's what you can do. As we move forward, we're actually gonna give you some more concrete and uh, details and flesh this out. So tighten up the focus of the case and I am the writing, shorten the case and add options as part of the case. And Eric, if you could go to the next slide. This I think is important because it helps give you a context for where we're coming from for the case research journal. And, and Eric has aptly named this slide, the myth of broad appeal. Um, what we can see often is that in particular, I think we see vividly come out in the IM, whereby under the intended audiences and use of the case, where we'll see statements like this case can be applied to many topics within a particular discipline marketing and can be used in a wide variety of cases. That may very well be the case and, and that it can be used. But for CRJ, what we look for and what reviewers and instructors who adopt the cases are looking for is actually a really tight, narrow focus. So it doesn't mean that your case can't be used across courses, across topics, but you will be able to write a tighter case and a tighter instructor's manual that will more likely be adopted. So our experience is, is that while organizational life can be very complex, and we see this a lot in particular in my area around strategy, where most questions and issues and decisions are multifaceted. But for cases, instructors typically want something that's gonna hone in on a particular topic that allow them to be able to engage with their students and enhance their learning in that area. So as an example, this case is intended for an undergraduate introduction to marketing course to interview students to, to the importance of product pricing strategy. And that becomes the framing then for what else is to come in your instructor's manual around your learning objectives. More on this as we move forward with some solutions, Eric is now going to shift to the decision focus and, and how it is for Case Research Journal, what we're looking for to help you um, align expectations. So when we talk about decision focus, we're, what we mean is the case is about the decision. And as Gina clarified, not just any decision, not a past decision, but the decision that is yet to be made, the decision that we are now facing. So I, one thing that I talk, to, I talk a lot about with students and with faculty uh, who write and use cases is the case is not about the protagonist. It's not about the company. It's not about the theory you're teaching. The case is about the decision that's going to be made. And the protagonist and the company history and the concepts are all important to help make that decision. But the focus is on the decision itself. What we see a lot, especially in first round submissions at CRJ, is there's an introductory paragraph that explains the decision somewhat. And I'm going to give a couple of examples uh, for, for effective and less effective use of that. And then there's eight pages of company history, background, information, um, and then the decision is brought back in the conclusion. And when we say the decision gets lost, that's what we're talking about. It makes it, to the reader, it makes it seem that this decision is tacked on, that really what you wanted to do was tell this story, and you've put this decision on there so that it can be a case. I'm not saying that's anyone's intention in, in particular. I'm saying that's how it reads. I know for myself, writing cases, there are cases I've written because I found the story of this organization so engaging. And I look for where is this decision? And sometimes the best I can come up with is, okay, what's next? And that's not usually a particularly compelling decision because it's so broad and because it's so difficult to wrap your head around, well, what does that mean? What's, what's coming next? Um, so don't lose sight of the decision. One piece of practical advice I can give you is in every section, possibly in every paragraph, depending on your writing style, bring back that decision. And what that does is it keeps the focus there, 
but it also helps the reader. It helps the student to understand why the information you're putting in the case may be useful, why that's important. Because otherwise, I'm reading through eight pages of case narrative without a clear sense of why I need to know this information. One comment I frequently write in my notes when I'm reading cases, when I'm evaluating them for the journal or for a conference is, I suspect a lot of this information is not gonna be used because while I'm reading it, I can't see how that's gonna happen. And by bringing the decision back in, you, get, you provide a clearer sense of that. Um, so how do we do this? As Gina mentioned, we include options. As a writing exercise, including options in the introduction and or conclusion forces us to think of this as a decision. Because if the decision is just what's next, the options we come up with are likely to be very vague, ambiguous, and broad. Whereas if the decision is, is pretty focused and pretty narrow, then there should be clear options to move forward. Really ask yourself whether the content you're including is relevant. Uh, well, the rule of thumb I use and I provide to authors is it has to meet one of three criteria. It has to be used in the IM, in the analysis. It has to be necessary as context to understand the organization or to understand the decision, or it has to be really, really super interesting. Okay, It has to be something that no one is going to mind reading an extra paragraph or an extra pa a couple of paragraphs because it's just fascinating stuff. If it doesn't meet one of those three criteria, uh, you probably can cut it or at least reduce it. Pick one thing that's being decided, focus on one clear decision. That doesn't mean because as, as Gina mentioned, organizations are messy. Don't put this decision completely in a vacuum and say, this is the only thing this organization has to decide ever. Contextual factors are important. Mentioning secondary or underlying decisions can be useful, uh, but make it clear to the student who's reading this and using this for their class what it is they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then there's factors that, that come from the introduction. So typically in a CRJ case, the introduction and conclusion will be the same scene. Uh, it will be the protagonist in a situation where they are contemplating the decision or looking ahead to when the decision needs to be made, having a clear timeline about that. When is now in the case? When does the decision need to be made? What may happen between now and then? I'm going to give you just verbally a couple of quick examples of more and less effective use of decision focus in, in introduction based on cases I've written and cases I've read. So one would be uh, John is looking around his store with pride. They just, he just moved his business from a smaller location to a larger location. The landlord of the new location visited him yesterday and said that the, the space upstairs from him would be available within four months. The lease of the person, uh, the company currently renting that space was up and the landlord was offering John the opportunity to lease it. John had ideas about what he might use that space for, including expanding his store, starting an online operation, or offering food service, but he was unclear whether the economics of that would work out. So that's one example. We see a timeline, we see clear options, it's very clear what decision needs to be made. Second example might be, John looked around his store with pride. He had just moved from a smaller location to a larger location, and the move had gone very smoothly. Now that he was in the bigger space, he knew he wanted to expand, but he wasn't quite sure how he might do that. Um, there were lots of options available to him, but he hadn't thought, that, thought them through yet. And with uh, you know, less, fewer resources than he might want, um, he would really need to make that decision. Well, now it's kind of a vague decision. It's a what's next decision. He's done this thing. In both instances, he's accomplished something. But in this second one, it's not clear where he's going. You're putting the onus on the student to come up with ideas. Students may look at options like retail type options, online, new location, expanding the space, but they may look at completely different options like staffing options or financing options. So by not offering those clear options in the case, those alternatives, and not focusing the decision sufficiently, you're making it actually more difficult for them to get to the type of analysis you want them to do. Eric, before you move on, I just want to yeah. highlight that part about the 
um, the start and finish of the case the same point in time. This will help you as a reader, as a writer as well, um, to hone in on the case decision. So if you start the case and end the case with the exact point in time and scene and the decision, it helps you actually anchor. Think of it this way. You're anchoring your case narrative in that decision in the front and the end. And then really what happens in between means you can go back in time to give us some additional context. Um, and so it's in between that goes back to a period of time, usually prior to the decision to lead us back to that decision again. And so this is a stylistic consideration that will also help you as a writer focus in on that decision that you that still needs to be made. Great, yes, I, I agree completely. Um, moving ahead into case content, I'm not gonna go over decision focus again. The, the way you focus the decision and you, you uh, structure your case around that will have large implications for case content because it will impact what content you put in your case. It will force you to be less backwards looking and more forwards looking. Remember, we're not asking the students to only analyze a decision that was made in the past, we're asking them to make a decision going forward. So as an author, I advise you to really ask yourself, does this analysis of the previous decision inform the, the decision making going forward? If yes, great, that could be an interesting question or a couple of questions in your IM and then link that to the new decision. But if it's just so that we can demonstrate a particular theory they made this decision, this was the outcome, that's a good example of, well, then it's not a decision-focused case. It's an example case, which is not what we're looking for at the Case Research Journal. Um, the issue that I mentioned earlier about the protagonist being in the case, Gina is going to talk a bit more in a moment about that when we talk about bias and editorializing. But additionally to that, when I read cases where there's, you know, um, Bharat is a med med marketing manager of a company, he is meeting with Seema, the CEO, but before that, he went to go meet with Gurdip, uh, to, uh, who was his former professor, to ask him about this problem. Well, as the reader, I no longer know who the protagonist is. It adds complexity. Who am I helping? Why am I needed if Gurdip is helping Bharat? Because I'm supposed to be helping Bharat. And so um, it becomes a much messier, more complex way to understand the case, as opposed to having one protagonist. And make sure, just like we're bringing the decision back throughout the case, you're bringing your protagonist back, either with quotes or the type of information that they're looking through. Just remind the reader that they exist and that this is their decision so that we can identify with them and want to help them with their problem. Um, and then the, the other issue with case content is if the author is in the case, there's a, it calls into question the trustworthiness of the information. Um, and if the case is disguised, it makes it difficult to verify the information as well. In terms of solutions to how we make this more forward looking than backward looking, obviously you're writing a case about something that happened in the past. We're actually insisting that you use the past tense throughout. So we know this is all past information, but what we're looking for is past information that is useful to the current decision, as opposed to past information about a past decision. So keeping in mind the use of the case, the fact that students need to make a decision based on the information you're providing, that means you need to make sure that information is in the case. A handy tip for doing that is when you're done writing the instructor's manual, and some people write the instructor's manual first and some people write it second, but whenever you write it, when you're done writing the instructor's manual, look through or have a co-author or colleague look through and in a very critical way, ask yourself, is all the information I'm using in this analysis in the case? Because if it's not in the case, how are students going to know this? And then you might need to add something like a suggested reading about uh, background reading. That's a way of doing it. It's better if the information's in the case. You may add information about a prerequisite course or topic that would have been covered when you write your teaching suggestions section or when you write your intended courses section. Uh, but again, it's better if the information can be in the case. 
And again, adding these options is a good step because then when you're writing the case, you can look and say, well, what do I really need to evaluate these options? And then in terms of the protagonist and the trustworthiness of the case, I can give you an example from my own case writing. So I co-wrote a case with an owner of a business. It was a restaurant business um, and my co-author Bruce was the owner of this restaurant business. I have to be very careful about the information. I have to verify information. Um, so I looked at industry data. When he talked about margins and that sort of stuff, I looked up, well, what are typical margins? Why might this restaurant margins be different? Um, I have to, as the second author, as the non-business owner author, maintain my objectivity and push back against the company to say, no, I can't just put in all these nice anecdotes about the company. I need to make sure that there is unbiased information in the case. And this can be true whether the business owner is a co-author or not, because they do need to sign the release and that they, you know, and it's been my experience that some business owners or managers will ask that certain parts be removed or changed or quotes be changed. And as author, you have to make sure, am I still presenting an unbiased view or am I allowing bias to creep in? Um, avoid having uh, the protagonist be a business owner whenever possible, okay? If that is not possible, if the case that you're writing is about your own business that you run on the side, uh, in addition to your faculty position, or if the company you're working with is insisting on having a manager or an, or an owner be a co-author, then don't disguise the case. Make sure that you have a mechanism by which to remain unbiased, whether that's bringing on another author who's completely removed to check for bias, to write sections of the uh, instructor's manual analysis. Um, Use secondary data to verify and to support the information that's in the case, but make sure you're doing everything you can to free your case and instructor's manual from bias. If you are putting yourself in the case because stylistically that's what you're used to doing, because you believe that having an expert or a faculty, a former faculty member will help bring some of that theory in the case, my advice is, my first step advice is don't. Find another way to get that in there. There's nothing wrong with saying instead of um, John went to his uh, former professor and had this conversation, you can say John thought back to what he had learned in business school, if you really need to get that theory in the case. Um, remember to keep your protagonist active in the case and leave that professor figure out is my strong advice in that, uh, in that regard. I'm going to invite Gina uh, to, to now talk about writing stuff. Thanks so much, um, Eric. And, um, you know, again, I mean, I want to emphasize as Eric was talking about, you know, some of the solutions that we propose around that decision focus and if you're involved. I mean, CRJ will accept cases that have some element of disguise um, that is in there. But what we are trying to talk about is from your perspective, think about this is not what I may mean, feel like we're questioning what you're writing, and if it's accurate. Think of it this way. It's less about questioning you and more about that there will be other instructors who are going to be adopting your case. And it's more about giving them a sense of a security that they come to CRJ because they want to make sure, because the cases that we publish are based on real situations, real facts, they are well grounded in research, and, um, and they are objective. And so the instructors, you come to CRJ for those cases because of those components. And so think of it that way, it's, it's less about questioning you and, and, and your honesty, and it's more about a stylistic approach as to what we're looking for in CRJ and why so many instructors adopt. I mean, we've had more than 90,000 cases last year adopted by or through just Harvard. Um, and so that's just an example that actually indicates or is illustrative of how many instructors do like this style of case that we, um, that we publish for CRJ. As we move forward to, and I see a question and we'll come to it in just a second. Um, when we see case writing style is another consideration. And we've talked a little bit about this. 
you know, uh, we've said here really the easy part is the proof writing, copy editing, and getting the writing right. And, and certainly that can be a challenge. We have authors from all over the world. We have authors who, um, you know, um, write in multiple languages. Um, again, keep in mind that CRJ publishes in, in English and English only unless it is a special issue. And so, you know, I often, even if I'm publishing my own cases, sometimes will, um, you know, hire a copy editor to look over and to see. And if this is a way for you to be able to avoid some of this and get some greater clarity. One thing I do want to focus on is the harder part to manage, which we're referring to as editorializing. And in essence, I think a way to think of this is what we're hearing and seeing in the case is the author's voice and opinion. And almost always it's unintentionally. And from case research perspective, we want to make sure that the case again is written objectively. So instructors are coming at this to say, no, this is a case that actually I feel comfortable reflects the situation that happened. Eric, if you don't mind moving forward on the slide. So I'll talk a little more about the editorializing aspect. So again, this is not about intent to bias the information, but think of it this way. If you are stating conclusion or put in a different way, using judgment words or phrases like large, successful, smart, phrases like the company was well positioned for continued profitability. I think at first glance, you would say, well, what's wrong with any of that? And really there's nothing wrong with those phrases, but unless it is grounded in facts, so other information, or it is the opinion of a case character, it shouldn't be in your case narrative because you are actually making the conclusions for your reader. So, and I think, you know, both Eric and I have observed this, that when the author is also a case character, it worsens this problem. And it's, and it's because you are so close to the organization and the situation. There's, you know, this is about actually that you are, you have so much more information than anyone else who will read this case or use this case. And it means inadvertently you're including information or conclusions that actually other people won't have. So solutions to address this, use facts instead. So provide profitability or number of employees. So rather than saying, that they are well positioned for continued profitability, include actually, you know, the, the profitability um, figures for the last three years and actually the projections that the company has provided for the next three years or industry projections on, on growth of the market. Let the reader draw their own conclusion. Include content from publicly available sources where you can include as referenced material and cite your sources. The other way to do this is to actually use quotes from the case character. So opinion is fine in your case. It just can't be your opinion as the author. So if it's the CEO who thinks this and feels it, it's fine. A couple of examples to illustrate. So the first one here, an example where we would see that editorializing, Green was a well-respected business leader with a strong background in finance. And here's how I help myself sometimes in write it is asking myself this question, according to whom? And if I'm asking myself that question, it puts a flag up for me to say, well, is there enough in the case to ground this? So rewritten without editorializing, Alex Fields worked with Green for 10 years and described him as a well-respected leader who had a strong background in finance acquired from a graduate degree in finance and 15 years in the banking industry. So now we've grounded it in a particular character's opinion in the case, and we've added a little more to it to explain why they feel that way. The second example, Eric. So an example with editorializing, the company was the leading brand for quality and customer satisfaction. Again, I'd ask myself the question, according to whom or what? Two ways to rewrite this as an example. Consumer Magazine ranked the company as the leading brand for quality and customer satisfaction in 2019. 
And then we'd include out an end note here and then make sure we have the reference to Consumer Magazine at the end of the case. Another way, Yelp reviews in 2019 indicated that the brand was well known for high quality and the company's return policy was viewed as one of the best in the industry. See exhibit one for Yelp reviews in 2019. Still getting across the same point, but you can see now if I were an instructor that it is actually grounded in the opinion of case characters or factual publicly available sources. Eric, I'm going to ask you to move forward because I'm concerned about time. Eric, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add something. One thing I've done in the past as well is use the company's own website and say the company on its website described itself as, which then provides that information, but as Gina said, allows the reader to draw a conclusion because now they know that information is biased because it's coming from their own website. Um, quotes we would encourage in cases for, I believe, I feel very strongly actually that including quotes in cases brings the case to life. So when we can hear the voices of the characters, all of a sudden we move from what might be perhaps a bit of a stale, even if it's an important story, a stale story that isn't all that compelling. But when we can have those direct quotes, it brings it to life. Okay, now we've listed here a number of ways that are less effective in using quotes. So one long quote at the beginning, and then we see nothing else throughout the case, only in the introduction or conclusion, um, or very long quotes throughout or no quotes at all. Eric, if you want to just put up then the effective use of quotes. This is where the one, Eric, please move forward with them at my animation. So have quotes in the introduction and conclusion, but also weave them throughout. Try also, I would encourage you, if you have more than one person you've interviewed, to have those different voices and quotes in there because it adds a sense of tension, differences in opinion, so that as a reader, we think, oh, okay, this is not a one-sided story. Um, and then break up long quotes and use parts of them. So you can also write the narrative where you're saying, this person thought without necessarily including the direct quote, but their quotes bring the case to life. It helps us also as an instructor or a reviewer feel that actually, okay, this is not just the opinion of the author. Actually, here is what the CEO or other case characters have said. Now, I know we have a couple of questions already in the chat box. I don't know, Eric, let's perhaps we start with, with these. Um, yes. for a few minutes and then we move forward a little bit. The first one there from Kita, will case study based on past individual experience in human resource domain or consumer behavior section be acceptable for publication? Um, I'll, I'll start on that one. If Kita, if your question is, um, if you have had experience when you worked as let's say director of HR and you wanna write a case about that, I would say in many ways, it goes back to some of the parts that Eric and I have already said. You can write a case where you are the case protagonist or you have been involved in the organization and have some insight. However, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. I would say to you, you really need to make sure that actually you can get access to some of those other people who were with you in the organization at the time and get their approval to include their voices and their opinions in the case. So that would be one thing. The other thing that I would say to you is that really you should be able to get the organization's approval, even if you're no longer there, to be able to write that case about the organization. And thirdly, as, as we've talked about before, I would encourage you to bring in an independent um, co-author who is able to interview some of those people and also in the analysis in your instructor's manual that, that that person actually takes the leadership role in the analysis because they're coming at it from a perspective where they don't have that intimate knowledge. Eric, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, I was actually going to answer the next question, which is how long it takes to get a case published once it's submitted to CRJ. It varies widely, and it's not just because of how appropriate your case is for CRJ when you first submit it, although that is a factor. For myself, 
I have had cases that have been published after two rounds of reviews. I have had cases, as Gina knows, where I'm complaining by the fifth round of reviews, saying, how much more do you want out of me? Um, one of the biggest factors for how long in terms of uh, time it takes is how quickly you can get those revisions. Uh, our reviewers are excellent, and we typically get back to authors on their submissions within 60 days. Where the delays often come in are in the authors getting their work back to us. Again, most authors are excellent in this regard. They want their work to be published, but I have worked with authors where there is a year between, the next, between submissions. And for CRJ in particular, compared with other journals, that can be potentially problematic because once a decision becomes very old, once a decision, you know, decisions have an expiry date, professors aren't going to adopt cases where the decision took place a, a very long ago unless it's a really, really compelling case. So my advice to you as authors is if you do get that revise and resubmit, work on it. Uh, the quicker you work on it, the quicker you'll move through the publication uh, pipeline. See a question there as well around do we publish secondary source cases? And it's a great question. Um, what I can say is that we actually had a special issue this year um, for secondary source cases. Um, so we do publish them. Um, the other two things I'll say is that generally speaking, we do publish, but CRJ has a, a narrow focus in regards to what they accept as secondary source cases, um, typically looking at legal proceedings or a case that has an extensive list of, of secondary sources. Um, but we do publish them. And the third thing I'll say is you may want to look to the CRJ website under helpful information. And there's an article there that we published uh, just a year or so ago on publishing secondary sourced cases. And we talk about some of the distinctions between what works for CRJ, um, but what may not be most aligned to our expectations, but other outlets that will accept it. So yes, we do. Um, the this, this special issue that we're doing right now has broader um, implications, and it's really a trial for us to see how it works. But um, certainly look to our website to get more information on that. Um, I will just quickly answer a couple of questions I've seen. I know we have some hands up as well. Um, so in terms of cases where the solution was not actually, right, where the problem was not solved in real life, because the case ends at the point where the decision needs to be made, it actually doesn't matter whether the protagonist solved the, the problem in real life, um, because we're asking the students to put forward their best recommendation for what to do. Um, what the protagonist actually did is, is I wouldn't even call it secondary to, to most analyses in cases. I would say it's mostly irrelevant to what we're asking with our cases. The other question I would quickly answer, um, Yes, I agree uh, with the comment that sometimes the cases themselves are self-explanatory and the story contributes. Um, whether or not we should have such cases, absolutely we should have such cases, but one of the points we're making here today is that is not the style of case that we publish at CRJ. I'm, Gina nor I are saying that such cases shouldn't exist or that they're not useful or that they don't have a place in education. That is not the message we're sending at all. We're saying that's not the kind of case that is published at our journal. And in fact, I would add is that I have published such cases actually, but I've As not published I. them yeah. in CRJ. So, yes. so yeah, the other, I know we have lots of questions, which is wonderful. Another question around the tier of CRJ and ABDC. So CRJ is not ranked in the ABDC uh, list. Um, there are very few, actually. There are still a couple of journals, but I know in the last round, actually, some of the case journals came out of those rankings. But here's what we say in regards to um, the ranking of the journal. And we look to other indicators. So for example, one of the biggest ones is our distribution. We have the broadest distribution of any case uh, journal. Um, more than 90,000 adoptions of cases just through Harvard last year. So if you want to talk about impact of your case, um, you get a peer-reviewed peer journal publication, and actually your cases get used in classrooms, and we have lots of evidence of that. And that's more of our framing around the impact of CRJ. 
Eric, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, I would just add that uh, cases published in CRJ, there are royalties available for authors, assuming a certain number of adoptions. And one bonus with that royalty that you get is you do get a number of how many times your case was adopted by students. And that itself can be, I put that on my CV for some of my cases to say that a case I wrote has been used more than X number of times um, because I don't have that citation uh, number because it's it, the nature of the research that we're and contribution that we're making. I know we um, also have some hands up. I don't know, Eric. I mean, I'm I'm I know we're sort of getting short on time. I'm just wondering how best we move. Do we address the questions or have a couple of slides on the IM and then come back to the questions to clue up? I think we should get through a couple of the slides on the IM. I'm gonna skip through some of them and really focus on the areas that I see as potentially problematic for authors. Great, um, well, let's move forward and we'll come back to some of your questions. Yeah, so in terms of learning objectives, just make sure that you're using Bloom's taxonomy that you are providing a progression. So it shouldn't be four learning objectives where all of them are understand this theory. It should be first, possibly understand, and then maybe assess or evaluate, apply, create, um, and work towards uh, the higher order learning objectives is what I would suggest. And having a clear focus will also help with this. Um, in terms of the research methods section, Gina, is there anything you want to quickly go through? Yeah, I want to, uh, this section is incredibly important for CRJ and, and it, you know, not all journals actually require it. Um, not all case publishing outlets require it. My argument would be is regardless of where you intend to publish, including this section, is really, really important because it's really an opportunity for you to showcase um, that your case is actually research. Um, and that's a big part of what how we view cases at the case research. This is research. So your question about how is it ranked, the research methods is so important. Make it transparent. This will help you very much when you know when you might be an author who's also in the case, or if you have some relationship with the organization. This is where you build that credibility as a case writer to say this is based on well-grounded research, that you've triangulated the sources, um, that it isn't biased. And the other thing I want to make a note here is that if you've test taught the case, include that and tell us what changed because again, it increases the credibility of the usefulness of this case um, and that actually you have had the opportunity to test it out. It's not required to publish but it often does strengthen the sense of, wow, what a, what a well-grounded research case situation. These two sections I would just mention because I find, especially in cases submitted by authors based in India, they are missing or uh, lacking in substance. Um, theoretical foundations, again, like Gina said, this is research. You are making a contribution. Here is where you have the opportunity to talk about the type of contribution you're making in terms of theory. So oftentimes I find it's just not there. There is no such section or possibly a list of references. Um, that is not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is a brief explanation of the theories that you're using in the analysis, not the analysis itself. You're not talking about how to use the case information, but if I'm using, um, I'll just give it Porter's Five Forces or Ansoff's Matrix or flow charts or whatever. It's a paragraph that explains this is how you use Ansoff's Matrix. This is what it is. This is the research it's based on. This is how it's used. And then later in the analysis, when I use Ansoff's Matrix, the instructor who has read this manual knows what it is and how it applies. Um, for the teaching suggestion section, most often what I get is a heading that says teaching suggestions and then a time plan spend this much time on each question or each topic. That is not enough, that is insufficient. I have language that I've sent to dozens of authors that say, here is what I'm looking for and it's what you see on the slide. Explain how to teach the case. Remember that 
The person who adopts your case may be a tenured faculty with decades of experience who knows all this stuff backwards and forwards, but they may also be a first time sessional instructor who doesn't even have an advanced degree that doesn't know this stuff. So your teaching suggestion section has to work for all audiences. And so explaining how to move from topic to topic, if there's a particularly challenging discussion point, if you know that a question or a topic is going to inspire fierce debate, talk about that in this section. And then Gina is there. Gonna add yeah. Three quick things I'm gonna add around the discussion questions and responses. One tip I would encourage people to use is to explicitly link their learning objectives to their theory sections and to the discussion questions. So have for each of your discussion questions, link it to learning objective one, learning objective two. It will help you and it will help the reader and the instructor who's using your instructor's manual. Secondly, I would say when you think about the order of your discussion questions, they should be ordered in a way that think of it, the analysis that they do in questions one and two and three help students get to question four, which is the key decision in your case. So typically the last question links back to the decision focus in the case. And really those questions that come before it should feed into allowing the student to make that decision. And the third aspect is, is the weaving theory and research into your suggested answers. One of the hallmarks of an instructor's manual of case research journal is the linking or the application of theory and research to the case situation. So we want to see that in your answers when you're linking it back to case narrative. How does this demonstrate the application of a particular area of theory or research? And then the last thing I said three, but four is the notion, Eric's mentioned this before, that always be reading it to say, all, all the students have is the case narrative. Make sure that you're not including information in the instructor's manual, which the students don't see because they won't know to do it. They won't have that information. And over to you, uh, Eric, for our last slide, and we'll get maybe, we'll stay for a couple of minutes extra um, to answer a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, just remember that all of it has to fit together. So this sentence you see here on the screen, that the instructor's manual shows how to achieve the learning objectives by using a combination of case information and theory in the discussion questions response discussion question responses, and that you explain all of that, how that happens in the teaching suggestions. If you have sent a case to CRJ and I have been your associate editor, chances are you've seen this sentence somewhere in what I've sent you because this is the thing that pulls it all together. And if you use this as a guiding principle, it helps you stay focused and it helps you make sure that there is good fit between the case and the instructor's manual, between the decision and the theory that you're talking about, between the courses that you're teaching and how you're teaching it. It all has to fit together. As Gina just mentioned, sometimes that link is made explicitly. It's something I always forget to do in my cases that I submit to CRJ, but in the discussion questions, in parentheses, after the discussion questions, say which learning objective this addresses. And if you can't do that, either you're missing a learning objective or you're asking students a question that isn't related to what you're attempting to do as an instructor. When you're going through the theoretical linkages, link them back to the learning objectives. Same thing. All of this, all of these things that fit together are centered on the decision in the case that is to be made. Not a decision that has been made, but the decision that you're asking the students to work on. So the key takeaway from today is make sure it all fits together. And if, as I said, you use that as the headline, everything else should become easier. Thank you, Eric. And I know we are at time, but I am going to address those two questions. I see two open questions there. Does CRJ have a prior, priority focus areas, preferred topics or themes? Sometimes we have calls for special issues. And that's often where you'll see those special themes. Last year, we did one on women's entrepreneurship and we did one on healthcare management. This year, it's short cases, so less disciplinary focused and more stylistic and secondary sourced cases. So sometimes there are themes 
um, through special issues. But otherwise, we don't. Um, I mean, here's what I will say that if a topic is timely, then it does increase the likelihood that reviewers are going to like it and that actually reviewers and instructors are going to adopt it. So we do keep that in mind, but less, um, I will say directly to say, oh, it's a topic that isn't relevant, more about actually how your reviewers will respond to it. I would add to that, Gina, just from my own personal experience, as you know, the most recent case I have sent to Case Research Journal is on a hot topic. Uh, it's still got a major revision decision uh, in terms of what needs to be done because the content that myself and my co-author submitted simply was not quite there yet and that their work needs to be done. So the topic itself won't push it over. You still need to make sure you're meeting the standards, which uh, is, is are, are, they're rigid standards. They're rigorous standards, I should say. Um, you know, at the heart of what we wanted to achieve today was to encourage you to consider Sierra J and to help align um, the style of your case and what you're writing to making it um, be a fit um, and alignment with what CRJ is expecting um, and, um, and the review process. One last thing I wanna not talk about is how long does it take to get published? As Eric has said as well, that we strive to turn decisions around within 60 days. Fortunately, over the last year with COVID, sometimes it's taken a little bit longer because reviewers' lives are challenging, like yours, but that gives you a hint in regards to, you know, we try to turn it around as quickly as possible, and it will depend then upon how long it takes you to get those revisions. But I have still heard this year that we are still um, uh, one of the fastest um, despite all of the challenges um, that are going on with COVID and how busy all instructors are. Eric, any final um, comments that you might want to, to make? Uh, just on what you were talking about, about the reviews and turnaround, the other thing you may not know if you haven't submitted or reviewed for the Case Research Journal before is how extensive the reviews and the type of feedback you receive. Our reviewers and the uh, Gina and myself and the other associate editor take a very developmental approach, uh, a very constructive approach. So unlike at uh, some other, uh, not case journals, but at typical research journals where there is a lot of pointing out flaws and looking for reasons to reject a paper, we really would like to work with authors to find a path towards publication if possible. And I guarantee you that if you send us a case um, and uh, it is you know, good enough to be submitted and sent out for review and take the reviews and work on it and you put in the effort, we will not abandon your case and say, no, it's just not gonna work. The only times I can think of where an author has gotten a reject uh, decision, have been either the cases really not suited at all to what we do, there's a misalignment, or if the authors have demonstrated that they are unwilling to make the changes that the reviewers are asking for. Um, our goal is to help people get published. Now, Gina, I saw there was one final question on acceptance rate, which is sort of related to what I'm talking about, so I don't know if you wanna close with that, but. Yeah. It's, a, it's an encouraging process. It's extensive. There's a lot of in content in the reviews, but it's all intended to help you get your case published. Yeah, and I'm going to say that our acceptance rate generally runs between 30 and 40 percent. And while some might say, oh, goodness, that's not high at all. I want to add a couple of things to that. I will actually say, keep in mind, it is a peer reviewed journal. The other thing that I would say is that within that, those statistics also consider, for example, that sometimes authors decide to go elsewhere, right? Um, because they say, well, actually, this is probably a better fit for this particular outlet as opposed to CRJ. The most important thing I would say to you is, again, as Eric has said, we adopt the developmental approach. We want to be able to publish your case. We will work with you to do that. Sometimes the data that you have isn't, won't get you to the place where it needs to be for CRJ. But even in that instance, we will offer suggestions as to what might be a more appropriate publishing outlet for your work. So we do mm. not abandon you in the process. Um, the first time I published in CRJ, I think I had six rounds of revisions. 
And when I think back, I, I would have given up except the editor at the time, um, you know, really adopted that developmental approach. Um, and that is part of the learning process. And I can guarantee you that when it is published, I, every single author has said to me, my, it was hard, but my case is much better now as a result of that process. Um, thanks everyone. I know we are at time. We probably need to clue up. Michael has put all kinds of information about where you'll get a copy of this um, recording. I want to thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure. And we hope to see you at NACRA this year and um, to see your submissions coming into Case Research Journal. Final words to you, Erin. Well, well, thank you all for joining us and taking the time. Apologies, we ran over time a little bit into your evening, um, but I hope you found it useful. The comments uh, thanking us are much appreciated. And as Gina and I both put there, if you do have follow-up questions or issues that were not dealt with in this presentation, feel free to reach out and we will respond.